you know, I was asked to present a few cases um, to talk about these expanded indications. And as Dr. Ziegler just mentioned, I saw on the one of the questions on the chat was regarding uh, hybrids. And, and don't forget that the PCM disc, which, which was no longer on the market, which was approved, the, the FDA trial did uh, have that study done next to fusion. So technically, artificial disc is uh, FDA approved next to fusion. The Synergy trial currently is also uh, being done next to fusion as a uh, alternative or a standalone single level. Uh, so uh, hybrids are, are uh, and there's been a, a, lot, a fair amount of studies on those. I'm not going to get into all that here. I was just asked to show a few cases to demonstrate that really to, I think, help the uh, more uh, the earlier arthroplasty surgeons sort of think about what they can do as time develops their skill sets develop as they find different discs that they like and each disc does something differently. So uh, hybrids and multi-levels are certainly things that have been discussed. Gornet just pub uh, published a paper, I believe it was over 130 patients and three at four level. Dr. Coyar and I are gonna publish our series of over hundred patients as well. And then uh, we've did publish a small series uh, revi revising uh, pseudarthrosis to arthroplasty. So let me just jump in to show you these cases very quickly. Um, uh, this is just a 52 year old, she's a trainer. So very active here in, in, at Gold's Gym in Venice. Um, and she had all this, this old fusion, you know, many years before, eight years ago, uh, neck pain, arm pain. I always get a CAT scan. I always check the facets. You can see the facets uh, uh, above and below are intact and uh, healthy. She's a bit auto fused there at her index fusion level. So the, the foramen were a bit tight and stenotic. So uh, the plate was removed and then the artificial discs were placed here. Um, I choose different discs depending on different anatomical structures and uh, different stress loads, which would be another discussion altogether. But here you see, she has great motion. She has complete uh, relief of symptoms. And uh, I've been seeing her now for about six, seven years. And she's actually my wife's trainer now. <laughs> So uh, she had a fantastic result. So you can top and bottom off, and I did something similar. This is a physician, a 55-year-old physician. Uh, she's a very petite woman, uh, ER physician from Hawaii with neck pain, chronic headaches, with some mild radiculopathy, multi-level, and severe degenerative disease really at four levels. And this demonstrates uh, the MRI and the protrusions into the foramen at each level. You see the degenerative disc. Again, I always get a CT scan checking the facets. Uh, almost every single arthroplasty patient gets a CAT scan unless they're really young. And here I, I check the foramen for uncinate spurs to be sure I resect these at each level as I, I progress. And uh, this was a four level prestige LP placement here and her uh, symptoms have totally resolved. I saw her back from Hawaii about two years ago. This is about six years ago now. So she is um, doing extremely well and out paddling. She paddles the race all around the islands and does the whole thing. And she no longer has the neck pain, headaches or ridiculous symptoms. And she's still doing quite well. Here's a set of films on her that are later. Now I pr presented this case before. This is one of the uh, uh, patient who, uh, the indications for this were, were, were really more, he's a long shore, but he's a signaler. He signals for the containers and he can, if you look at his extension film, he really can't get his head back. He had a two level MOBC and he has grade four HO at five, six and grade three at six, seven. Uh, he has degenerative disc at, at four five, uh, which really didn't appear to be symptomatic, ridiculous uh, wise. He was really more worried about range of motion increase. So I reversed the, the uh, took out the two mobies, reversed and cut away the bone, and removed the uncinates, and you really skeletonize around removing the disc. And I placed the two uh, pro disc C's here for structural integrity. And you can see he has much better extension on the film on the right by uh, taking out discs. So I want to also put in the minds of, of those that, you know, if, if you have an artificial hip replacement that fails or has issues, you replace it with another hip replacement. You don't fuse it. You, you can actually reverse these and regain functional motion. He's still now working as a longshoreman. I told him about two weeks ago, I think I need him to unload the containers down here, but I don't know how that's going. But he has good motion on lateral bending. 
And so that was from before and then after. So that went right, right, uh, very well. I'm just sort of speeding through these, and this will be the last case, and then we'll have Q and A. Um, I just want to run through these. Now, this this is a more interesting and more recent case. Um, she had this. She's a 60 year old woman. Came to me from Louisiana. Uh, she had horrible neck pain and left radiculopathy C7. She had multiple surgeries leading up to this construct. She has a non-union. You'll see that on the CAT scan at cervical 6-7, very restricted range of motion here. And what they told her to do, uh, and her facets are reasonably healthy at, at all levels. So if I check facets at the levels that have prior fusions, which you see here at 4 5, five six, and you see a non-union at 6-7, and the facets are healthy at all levels. So we have five discs in our cervical spine. She has five discs fused in, in essence. And that was recommended that they extend her cervical two to seven fusion from cervical two to thoracic three. This is something she did not want. She was already in chronic pain and asked me if I could place an artificial disc at her non-union. And I said, yes, uh, are you interested in restorative motion surgery and, and really increasing mobility? I can reverse the two fusions above. So she wanted to do that. And uh, we cut out the fusions, removed the plate and put it, placed uh, three discs here. So she went from five disc fused to two disc fused. I don't like to have people fused more than two levels. I personally have multiple hybrid levels. I'm uh, my lumbar, all five discs two are fused, three are protices, or protoscales, and then my cervical is a hybrid as well. So I, I believe hybrids and uh, restoring some motion here. This is four days post-operatively before she went back to Louisiana. I made her go get a gentle flexion extension film and she had better uh, ranging already. And her radicular, it was interesting at the non-union level, they had a, uh, a, P, a, a titanium coated peak graft that was loose and wiggling and it had bone or it had shavings of the titanium could directly built up with granulation tissue over the left C7 root. So I cleared out that whole fusion. So you see a larger disc at, at the non-union level below than you do at the two above. And then uh, there you drill out the peak, you take the uncinase and then you uh, can place the disc and get uh, fantastic results. If I just if I just back up here, if you look at her bone on the far left, you know, her bone is very sclerotic at each level. So I'm really not concerned here about subsidence or anything else. Her bone densities, I did check, were all normal, of course. And uh, she had very sclerotic dense bone. So I wasn't really concerned with that. The other thing I always do is you notice the footprint. I always use an XL um, and the bottom disc is an XLD or deep. So extra large deep or extra large. You get that big footprint which I helps, uh, helps prevent subsidence when you're underneath a fusion uh, like this. So um, those are just some cases I'm showing that are sort of expanding the indications, expanding our thought process about our, our processes, about arthroplasty and, and, and what we can potentially do with it and, and help people regain some functional motion as well uh, as, uh, you know, reduce their pain and, and, and neurologic function and get away from, these huge fusion constructs, which I think are such a disservice to, to patients in general. And I believe Armin's right. You know, the, the whole paradigm of, of, few, of our, our, uh, disc surgery in itself is going to move away from fusion and move towards arthroplasty. And I think the companies feel that as well. But the patients are the ones seeking us out now on the Internet. And and and, and as Dr. Kastorian said, it's they're the ones going there, looking at these YouTube videos, seeing this, and they're told by these doctors, so, well, I'm going to fuse your entire spine. They're going to go on there and find doctors who are going to think differently, who want to sort of expand indications and, and, and try to uh, uh, bring arthroplasty uh, further forward. And the patients are helping push that, as well as the skilled surgeons that are uh, working with it. So I'll take some um, Q&A or comments and listen to everyone yell at me for doing things I shouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> you can rename your you can rename your talk to you did what you did what <laughs> but uh, I think it's a nice juxtaposition of Armin's talk, which really just proceeds in our thought process of for primary disc pathology in the cervical spine, 
um, of something that we got booed off the stage four or five years ago. I remember Armin and I were at NAS or one of those things, and we proposed that arthroplasty in the cervical spine was now the gold standard, and that was not met very comfortably. And I think now I, I, it pretty much, you know, arguably, you can make an argument that it is. Um, and, you know, and then the, the Todd's presentation, which is, which is truly a reconstructive advanced placement course, and, uh, you know, I don't think very many people will be able to or should do it, but I think this presents something for a very complex restorative situation that, uh, <clears throat> you know, that needs to be talked about and, and someone's got to push, push the envelope. And, um, so I, I think, uh, we can open to questions and the people who are attending via the zoom, if you want to type in questions on the chat, we'll keep an eye out for that as well. There's a question there on the chat about removing the plate. I don't always remove the plate. Um, if I'm going to place a pro disc, particularly on a bottom off situation below the fusion, sometimes I'll go with a more a sturdy core disc. I don't really like a mobile core or, or necessarily a, a compressible core when it's under a lot of load, particularly if you have longer fusion on top. But uh, so pro disc, you have the keel to worry about. So sometimes I just remove the plate because the placing the keel, I don't want any interference with the bottom of the plate, but I don't always remove it. Uh, just a, a question, um, and we appreciate you pushing the, the envelope, both in your personal body and in your, uh, your face. <laughs> uh, but, it, it, you know, the longshoreman who had uh, um, ossification really anteriorly and posteriorly uh, behind his first set of discs, uh, you know, are you not worried that he's a bone former, that just uh, that there's some physiology that some patients tend to form more bone and now you're setting them up, you know, potentially to do it again. So it just leads into the what's your longest term follow up on these replacement discs and are they remaining mobile or are a lot of them refusing? He, he's four years out at this point. And again, you know, you're right. We're early on this. I've had that discussion. I said, you may reossify. He, and a lot of these guys just he wants to get his time and in the docks to get his pensions for retirement. So he's like, I'll take 10 years, five years, whatever I can get. And I want to keep, cause I'm a signaler and he can't do it uh, like this. And, and uh, similar to the crane drivers who, who need the flexion. So um, he, so far, he, I think he's over four years out, Jason, you might know exactly. And um, he, he's still moving quite well. Uh, I haven't seen him in 21, but I saw him last year and he was uh, about four years at that time. So he may reform HO. Um, I do did tell him to take into methicin or other anti-inflammatories. I do that myself at least three days a week, I'll whether I have pain or not, or any inflammation, I'll just keep taking anti-inflammatories at least three, three, four days a week. I don't know if it does anything or not, but it, it, so far I don't I have a little bit of HO in my cervical disc. I don't have any in my lumbars, which have been in the three discs there have been in over 13 years now. So everybody's, I think it's, it's biology. I don't know. So we'll see if he develops HO around that or not. You know, I think you do a service for all of us. If you track those patients and just let us know annually or, you know, I can't, I, we are tracking everyone. Yes. And um, I need to put it all together, but I don't have a big enough series yet to make it valid. Um, so I'm just showing these anecdotal cases really. And well, we have several of those actually, but not enough to, publish a significant series. If I can also chime in <clears throat> as far as Jack's question, we're just pushing the curve back, right? So I think even though based on what I just presented on Chinese data, there's also some technical issues that I'm sure Todd does part of his surgery to minimize the HO that may reoccur that uh, we don't know what happened in initial surgery. So I think pushing that curve back is, in my mind, one of the key parameters that I'm trying to achieve with these patients, even if I'm taking down a patient who's developed early significant HO and replacing with another arthroplasty. But the question I had for you, uh, Todd, was a technical one, and one of them you already answered as far as getting a large footprint, but I also noticed that you have heights in those discs, both on the shoreman as well as the lady that you took down. Are you putting in sixes and sevens there? Yes, and sometimes I put in eights. You know, the, the issue is because you're right. When you're cutting out a fusion, you're going to lose bone, so you need to be prepared with the correct heights. I, I believe, like Simplify has four, five, six. I don't think they make a seven. I could be wrong. And then uh, Prodisc has a five, six, seven. Prestige has uh, five, six, seven, and eights, which is weird because they made the eight millimeters and released them in Japan, which was 
kind of an odd thing, but now we can use the eights here. So I always have Prestige LP on hand. I also have Prestige LP on hand if I'm doing, uh, I had a double non-union in a patient and I had to put two uh, on a, on a um, I had to put two discs in and I had to shave. It was a, a five, six, six, seven. And the C6 vertebrae was so thin that I couldn't use pro disc. I was worried about splitting the vertebrae. So I had to switch to prestige LP. So I had both of those there because they don't have a keel on LP. And uh, I like the LP motion on the lower segments for, for stress. There's one quick question. I have to go to the lab, Todd. Excellent lecture. Beautiful surgery again. Uh, expanded indications. Let's talk about patients with uh, immune suppressant medications, DMARDs, um, uh, methotrexate, nicotine. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of having these patients kind of be on these medications and getting a disc arthroplasty? I really, uh, I don't think it, I, I don't know that it matters that they're on those medications as far as osteointegration. I, 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 I haven't really looked at that. I think that I think that if you're going to fuse them, you have a, it's a riskier than if actually you would do an arthroplasty. I think you have a better chance with an arthroplasty. I could be wrong about that, but intuitively, that, those are my thoughts. Um, I, but I don't think it, it necessarily would matter. I might wait longer before I engage them back in a full physical uh, exercise activity structure. Thank you, Todd. Todd, uh, great job.